All right, hello everyone, and welcome to today's lecture on convolutional networks. Convolutional networks are a structured form of network um, that is commonly used in images, but also used in things like sequences or audio or other similar, similar domains. Um, and it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that convolutional networks are in some sense, historically, the most important structured deep network, at least in the history uh, of deep learning so far. So I know that things like transformers are getting a bit more popular these days. But if you look back at kind of the influence that that networks have had, it's hard to overstate the impact of convolutional networks on the field of deep learning. So we're going to talk about these today. Now, today is going to be a bit of kind of a, a look ahead to a certain extent. Much of our later course is going to focus on different structures of networks, right? So convolutional networks, we'll also talk about recurrent networks and, and transformers. Uh, but today it's going to be a bit of a look ahead. And we're going to, after this lecture, we're going to come back to more concrete issues of implementation of linear algebra. But this, but in order to implement convolutions, we'll actually need that. And so to motivate, in some sense, some of the later work that we're going to be doing in efficient linear algebra, we're going to first talk about this structured form of network called convolutional networks. All right, so let's jump in. The outline for today is we're first going to talk about convolutional operators. What is a convolutional operator? And how do you incorporate it in a deep network? Then we'll talk about some practical elements of convolutions. And finally, we'll end talking about how we differentiate convolutions. In other words, how do we incorporate these things into automatic differentiation tools? All right, so let's first talk about convolutional operators in deep networks. So far in this class, we've been considering networks that essentially treat entire image inputs as vectors. So when you implemented, if you have yet implemented homework one, uh, your fourth or, or homework two rather, the first thing you did was when you applied a network to the MNIST data set is you first flattened the images. So you took all the structure of an image, uh, it's a 2D shape, and this only has one channel um, in MNIST, but you took this whole 2D shape and you just flattened it into one long vector with 784 elements. And this works OK for MNIST size digits that are 28 by 28. And therefore, the vector representation only has 784 different, different components. It's quite a different thing if you have larger images. This does not scale as an approach, right? Because if you had something like a 20, 256 by 256 RGB image, that would result in a about 200,000, so three channels times 256 times 256, that's about 200,000 dimensional inputs. And if you wanted to just map that to a single hidden layer that was, say, 1,000 dimensional, that would require 200 million parameters. Now, this, this slide used to be more impressive when no one would ever think about a model that big. Um, of course, now, it's, now it seems a bit less, <laughs> less extensive as a network size, because people, of course, train these kind of networks all the time. But for a fully connected layer, that is why this far, far too much. There's way too, too many parameters for a single hidden layer in a, in, a, in, a, in a network that processes an image. And the reality is this would just not capture nearly enough structure in the image to actually capture it very well. So it's, it's a whole lot of parameters for sort of any practical uh, method. But the, the second thing is just wouldn't work that well. And the reason why it doesn't work that well, besides just involving too many parameters that are going to overfit to your data, is that it doesn't capture the intuitive invariances of, that we sort of expect to have in an image. Right? So we, we kind of know that if you take an image and you shift it over by one pixel, it's the same image. right? The image itself doesn't change. But if you think about what we're doing here, we're sort of taking this whole, to create you know, a single hidden unit, we're taking this whole image, multiplying it by the flattening it, multiplying it by a single row or column in a, in a, in a matrix, and we're sort of forming, that's, that's all the form, this one single entry in our hidden unit, right? And then the next hidden unit here would have a whole new set of weights multiplied by this, right? And we multiply every single element in the input by a whole nother set of weights for this. And this just doesn't seem to sort of capture the actual structure we know that there is in images. And to be, to be clear, this notion of trying to embed structure into the architectures of deep networks that is in some sense matched well with the input, that is in some sense the key idea that will dominate the design of deep learning architectures in practice. Right? We want some sort of design to the architecture that preserves the kind of structure that we want that we have in the image. 
And so what convolutions are, are convolutions are, in some sense, a simplification of this idea by two basic premises. And the first premise is that instead of, well, I should say the, the, the sort of the zeroth premise, <laughs> is that instead of representing our hidden units just as a itself an unstructured vector, like our input, we're actually going to represent our hidden units also, in some sense, as an image as I shouldn't really say images because images usually mean to so channels we can see, but as a 2D, really 3D tensor that have kind of spatial locations and then multiple channels eventually. Here I'm just showing multiple spatial locations. Uh, we'll later add multiple channels in a second. But in this case, we're going to think of our hidden vectors here as also 2D objects representing kind of locations in an image. And convolutions have two properties. The first is that these interactions happen in some sense in a local manner. So this hidden unit there is influenced primarily or maybe solely by the, the inputs in the previous layer that are in some sense near that spatial location. Right, so we treat the, the this is sort of point zero and one, I suppose. We treat the images, we treat the hidden layers as spatial images, and we have the weights only apply locally to images in the input to produce the hidden layers. And so the sort of vision of what that looks like here is that it's only these set of pixels multiplied by our weight that results in the next, in this single location in the next layer. Right? So that's the first premise, this local interaction. The second premise is that weights are shared across locations. So rather than have sort of one set of weights for this hidden unit and a whole other set of weights for this hidden unit, we take the same weight and we use that same weight kind of slid across the whole image to produce our next layer. And this structure is exactly what is known as a convolution. So what we're doing here essentially, the sort of slightly more kind of formal look of this is that we um, are able, actually before I do that, let me, let me uh, talk about the advantages of convolutions first then I'll, then I'll look at it a little bit more formally. Um, so what are the advantages of doing this? Why, why might we want to um, might we want to sort of build in this structure here? Well, there's a lot of advantages to it. The first obvious one is um, parameter count, right? So the first kind of obvious thing that we gain from this is we gain a whole lot of parameter efficiency, right? Rather than having this network with 200 million parameters, um, in the simple case here where we're sort of mapping a, a one channel input to a one channel output via this sort of three by three block of weights here, we actually uh, only need nine parameters, right? So that's going from, you know, uh, from, from I, I guess actually if we had even more networks, so if we went maps from a uh, 56 by 56 square scale image to a actual hidden unit of the same size, that would require four billion uh, parameters for sort of a single layer. And that is definitely too much. Um, on the flip side, if you do it with this convolutional structure, you need nine parameters, right? Because you just have the same weight that you slide across the whole image. And of course, this is sort of, uh, yeah. with that, you have much less, fewer functions you can represent. Of course, your function classes is vastly less than you could than you could represent over you know, a fully connected network here. But because we're capturing this, this structure that you actually want to capture, it's very beneficial to do so. Right, so it's very beneficial to actually capture the structure, and kind of a side effect is that you have many, you have, you have many fewer parameters you can represent your network much more efficiently. The other advantage is that this captures some of the actual invariances we want anyway. Right, so fewer parameters, and it actually captures these advantages because convolutions, at least to a certain degree, capture the natural invariances that we kind of think about in images. So for example, I talked about before that an image shifted over by one pixel is the same image. But if we had a different set of weights for each location, right, each location there and location there, et cetera, this wouldn't actually, or, or each hidden unit, now this is one set of weights, this is another set of weights here, this would not capture those invariances, right? You could have a very, if you shifted your, your image over by one pixel, now you have a different set of weights applying to each location. You might have a very sort of, um, very different set of hidden units, right? And so this really does, this with this, we're really able to capture the true structure of kind of what we want to have in images anyway, and convolutions bring us this benefit. Okay, so now let me describe what 
is the, a little bit more formal detail. What is the actual structure of a convolution? And the idea of a convolution, now written out a bit more formally, is we have our set of weights here. Okay? And we're going to take these weights and we're going to, in some sense, slide them across our image. All right, so this is a three by three set of weights. And we're going to kind of slide them across all possible positions are in our image to produce the output. So for example, for the first output, Y11, we would take this block of weights here, sorry, of, 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 of inputs here, multiply it by these weights to get this output. All right, so a little bit more formally here, if we want to produce the output Y11 here, so here actually the, the input um, is a vector z, the weights are a, a filter w, and or I should say really a, a tensor or matrix z. Um, the, the, the weights are a tensor or a matrix w. We'll talk about sizes in a second, and the output is a, is a, a similar sort of image y. Well, in this case, um, y11 here would be equal to the product of corresponding entries in our filter and our input. So we'd multiply this term by this term. So it's going to be equal to Z11 times W11 plus this term times this term, right? So plus Z12 times W12 plus Z13 times W13, et cetera. Right, so that's the that's the equation. We just take essentially the what it really is, of course, is it's just the, the inner product of this uh, this set of inputs treated as a vector, and then the set of weights also, in this case, sort of locally here treated as a vector. Right? Um, and then, you know, next we just slide it across the next location in the image, right? So now we would have that y12 equals, well, it would be this position times this position. So it would be z12 times w11 plus z13 times w12 plus etc. So that would be, you know, this location times this location plus this location times this location etc right and then we just keep doing this now i have it I have it written out here now so next we slide our filter across the next location then the next location etc okay and that is the op that that's the formal definition of the convolutional operator now one thing i should highlight here is that if any of you have a background in signal processing you'll notice that this is not actually what you have called a convolution uh, what you have called the convolution involves flipping the weights left to right and upside down. That's actually the, the signal processing definition of a convolution. But um, we'll get to those actually flipping in a second. Um, but uh, what, what we're doing here in signal processing is actually called a correlation. But the problem is that correlation already means something in statistics and machine learning. So that was a very bad term to use. And convolution just sounds just sounds so cool. So, so you know, we're, we're going to steal the term convolution and just define it to mean the convolution without the flipped filter. And I think at this point, um, I hate to say it, but I think like machine learning is kind of one. Like it's probably the dominant use of convolution <laughs> in some sense or in convolutional networks. Uh, I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek there, but but uh, this is how we define convolutional networks. And so whenever anyone from machine learning talks to you about convolutions, they mean this. They do not mean the flipped filters or the the, the reverse filter. They mean this, which you may have called a correlation before. But just know that um, this is a convolution. Okay. Um, now convolutions have actually a long history because they've been used prior to their use in machine learning, they were used in signal processing for a very long time. So they were used um, to just do do sort of both, I guess, classical signal processing, but also in uh, kind of computer vision and image processing as well. Um, and in particular, in image processing for a very long time, convolutions, not with learned filters. So in deep networks, we're of course going to treat the weights of the filter as our parameters, but in, in um, in image processing, it's very com it's been common for a very long time to use convolutions kind of with known pre-specified filters as a core operation for doing for sort of doing image processing and image manipulation. Um, so, for example, a common uh, so if we have this, ex this sort of this image here, you see on the left, um, and suppose we convolve it with this set of weights here. So that this set of weights is actually a two D representation of a Gaussian function, just sort of the exponential um, of, of the sort of x, x y position squared here. So it's centered at this location, 
and then just divide it by some number to sort of make it all. Um, this is actually this number here is the sum of all the entries there to make this um, uh, sort of an averaging operator. But this filter sort of does a weighted average of pixels, right? So you know this it's kind of hard to draw too much, but you know this pixel here would be an average of this pixel and this pixel and this pixel, etc. Um, it would be an average of all the sort of 25 pixels around that location. And if you do that, what you get is you get a blurred image, right? So you get an image that is more blurry because each pixel in this image is a combination of sort of pixels around that location in the previous image. Right? And that's what sort of this blur, Gaussian blur operation does. And it's accomplished via convolution. That's sort of how you can, how you can implement these things. Um, that's a bit sort of a simple example in some cases, uh, or in some sense, but a more complex one is using convolutions along with some, I should emphasize some sort of nonlinear operations here to represent things like edges or to detect things like edges in the image or to look at the image gradient and things like this. So if I convolve, if I take my original image Z uh, and I convolve it with this filter here, um, this filter sort of you know, has positive entries here and negative entries here. So that will, this computes something known as the image gradient. It sort of looks at how much the image is changing in the X direction and outputs sort of an amount that is, is large if the image is sort of increasing and small if it's decreasing and zero if the image sort of stays constant um, in the X direction. And similarly, this one here does it for the Y direction. And so if we take those two filters and look at their look at the, the their, their, their their squared sum and the square root of this so is essentially the, the magnitude of this of this um, of these two things. What you get is you get this image on the right here, which is essentially highlighting those portions of the image that where the image changes a lot. So this portion here, right, the image is changing from kind of a light color to a darker color. Uh, and, and this is therefore going to have, you know, high magnitude of the image gradient. Uh, whereas, you know, this region here isn't changing very much. It's kind of a static, a static thing. And so the, the, the image gradient is relatively small. All right. And, and this sort of thing is often the first step, say, in, in classical like edge detection algorithms. Often the first step is to compute exactly this image gradient. So these operations have been, have been used for a very long time, kind of in classical statistical signal processing and classical image processing. Um, but in deep networks, we often use a sort of the innovation is that we're going to do the same thing, just use learned filters instead of pre-specified filters to accomplish some task, right? So instead of trying to sort of say, okay, I want a filter that will blur the image or I want a filter that will compute gradients, we'll say, look, I just want to have a filter. I'm going to let the algorithm figure out kind of what filters to learn, what operations to apply to my images. And that's the, that's the, sometimes the fundamental idea of convolutional networks. Now I should mention one thing about convolutional networks, which is that they are never applied in, despite the fact that you often see convolutions kind of uh, drawn in that 1D sense that I showed you a few slides back, right? So they're, they're often drawn uh, kind of like, you know, a filter sliding across an image. Um, in practice, they are actually not done or, or very rarely there's any operations in deep learning that apply kind of to 1D inputs and to 1D outputs, right? We typically in deep networks have many uh, many different sort of, we, we want to have multiple different sort of um, layer or mo multiple different dimensions of the hidden layers. And the way we accomplish this in deep networks is that we have what are called multiple channels. So it's, it's sort of natural to think of the input X as having multiple channels, right? Because for example, a color image will have three channels, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. What we're going to do in deep networks is we're actually going to represent the hidden units also as having multiple channels, okay? And the, the difference here is that these channels in a hidden layer, they don't correspond to like a red, green, or blue. Often we're gonna have 64 or 100, we often like to use powers of two for some reason. That's not really necessary, but 64 channels or 128 channels or, or maybe 1,024 channels, right? Um, we use a lot of channels to represent kind of more complex and uh, you know more elements in the hidden layer. So each each channel is still this 2D spatial array, but we're going to use many of them. So you know one channel there, one channel there, etc., to represent our hidden units. Okay. So in general, we sort of think of our inputs 
And this could co correspond to our input image, but also could correspond to intermediate layers in the network as being a th rank three tensor with a height and a width, but also a number of channel inputs. Okay. We also think of our output as being a height and a width and a number of outputs. And so the question is, how do we map sort of multiple channel inputs with the convolution to multiple channel outputs? And the way we're gonna do it is we're actually going to have a separate filter, separate set of weights W for each possible input output channel pair, all right? And then we're gonna add them up. So if we want to sort of take, we wanna compute this element here of the first channel, okay? This would correspond to us. This would correspond to the um, this first channel here convolved with some filter, plus this second channel here convolved with some filter, plus this third channel here convolved with another filter, right? And that's how you get this first input. If I want this next uh, input in the next channel, I would have a whole, same operation applied to all my input channels, but a whole other set of weights. Okay. And the formal way of thinking about this, though I'll describe a better way of thinking about it later, is that if we want to take, um, for example, in our output, if we want to compute the S output channel, that would be the sum over all my input channels, so from R equals 1 to Cn, of my the Rth input channel times sort of the Rs convolution. So that's, the, that's sort of the mechanisms of this. But I'm actually not going to write this because there is a much better, I'm, 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 I didn't want to write that one out and, and have everyone sort of write it down too, because there actually is a much better way to think about multi-channel convolutions. And that is by thinking about the operations of these things and the channels themselves and all their operations as matrix vector operations. Okay, so the way to think about the, a, a, a um, multi-channel convolution kind of in the right way is that in our input image, so in this input that we have to our convolutional filter, um, you shouldn't think of these things as individual sort of scalar values like you normally would in a grayscale image. You should think about all of these things here as really vectors, each, each component, I should say. So let me sort of write uh, this like this, like each one of these, so say x22, so x22, etc. These are vectors in R to the C in. Okay, so where C in is our number of channel inputs. Okay, so that, that's pretty natural, right? Because you think of these things, you know, you think of each of these things as having like uh, a whole bunch of um, channels. And that's like thinking of each of these inputs as kind of itself a big vector. Okay, and similarly for the output, the output's also going to be vectors, not actually in, in uh, so this one here, for example. These are going to be vectors not in the input channel size, but actually in the output channel size. So it's going to be vectors in R to the C out. And now here's the key point. The way you should think about the filters you are convolving with is that each element of your filter is actually a matrix. Okay, so these terms here, say W11, etc. These are going to be matrices which map, and I guess in this in this notation here I'm using here in R to the C out by C in. Okay, and then what we do, we have our same operation as before. It's just that, you know, Z22 here is equal to sort of in the same way W1 times X, in this case, 22. But this product here is now a matrix vector product, right? So in some sense, the, the way you should think about 2D convolutions, I would argue, is not like this. I mean... To be clear, your, your sizes are also the same here, right? So your, your input is a, a rank three tensor. If you add a batch dimension, it'll be rank four then, but, but sort of a single input is, is a rank three tensor. A, the output's also a rank three tensor, height by width by either channel input or channel outputs. And then your weights here are a rank four tensor because you have a sort of this K by K filter for every pair of inputs and outputs. But the way to think about that is actually not by thinking about this as a, a rank four tensor. Think of it as a sort of K by K 
set of filters. K here is, uh, I should have mentioned before, K here is called the, the kernel size. It's sort of in this case, in the next case, three by three, but it's it can be sort of any any sort of size you want. Um, three by three is very common in deep, in deep networks. And each element of this three by three filter though, is instead of being a single element that's a sort of a scalar value, it is in fact a, a matrix. And this is gonna be really valuable to think about it this way, not just for the purposes of sort of simplifying the equations, but also for the purposes of really implementing these things. You want to implement these things as matrix operations. And so doing it in this form is gonna be how we actually, how we actually implement these things. Okay, so with that all being said, let me now talk about a few more elements of practical convolutions because the convolutions I described there um, have some, have some uh, issues that need to be addressed or rather you know, some, some things that need to be added in order to make them kind of fully usable within deep networks. Um, so the, we're actually going to talk about a few different aspects of convolutions that you, that you may have seen before if you've ever used a convolutional library uh, or a convolutions in a library like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, the first of these is padding. So one thing you may notice about the, the convolutions I described before is that these convolutions, let me just go back one slide, right? These com in, in these convolutions, the, the size of the input is different than the size of the output because we only, you know, in a five by five, uh, I guess five by five by however many channels, but think again about these as, as, as 1D things. Um, in a five by five input image, there are only sort of nine locations that you can place this filter here without kind of going off the edges, right? Um, so you can place it here, here, I mean, I showed this before, uh, here, et cetera, but then you run out of space, right? So you can only form a three by three output. And this is a bit annoying if we do this in deep networks. I mean, to be clear, we actually could do this. Um, it would probably work fine. But when you have really big networks, it more just gets to be a pain to kind of keep track of what's the size of your image. And you know, if you eventually then sort of average things together, well, what's the size that I'm averaging? All these, all these things are kind of, kind of uh, annoying to keep track of. And so what's very common to do, and to be honest, I don't know why this is not the default setting in every single convolute and every single uh, library, because this is what everyone does in every single architecture you will see. What was, was simply done in practice is that you pad the input with zeros such that your output is the same size as your original input. Okay, so if I have a four by four sort of input here and I wanna run a three by three convolution, I don't just run it on you know the, the four locations I can resulting in a two by two output. What I do is I pad the image with these gray cells here, which represent just zero values. And now when I convolve the, the, the image with this, I get the, the outputs that the same size as my input. And in fact, the, the precise formula here is if my filter, if my convolutional filter here is k by k, then I need um, to pad the image with k minus one divided by two zeros on all sides. Uh, this actually works only for odd kernel sizes k. We typically don't deal with Im with even uh, kernel sizes because they're they're precisely because they're a bit more of a pain. They have to have a different case for padding on one side and the other side. Um, so for this reason, we actually typically deal with odd size kernels. Um, but this is this is extremely standard. So essentially, everyone um, uses odd size kernels and uses zero padding such that the output image size is the same as the input image size. All right, so that's sort of uh, practical property one. Another practical property deals with pooling operations or strided convolutions. Um, and these are actually two ways of solving kind of the same problem. So one thing you may have noticed with, especially with this past zero padding version of convolutions is that we keep, when we apply a convolution, we keep the same resolution in our subsequent layer as we had in our original layer. And this is not always the best thing, right? So and, uh, to be honest, it's, it's maybe not a horrible idea, but um, in many cases in convolutional networks, we actually, as we go through the network progressively, we actually wanna create lower and lower resolutions, kind of more summarized uh, versions in some sense of our input. And, and that kind of represents features in some very abstract sense. You might think this sort of represents features at different levels of, of of abstraction or different levels of sort of, you know, the hierarchical representation. Though that's 
kind of debatable maybe whether it's really doing that or whether you need to do that or whether it's just about computation. But certainly computationally, right, you, you don't want to be dealing with 256 by 256 uh, images the whole way through. It's just would be actually quite hard to, to deal with. And so because of that, we often want to downsample these images at internal layers of the network, especially when we have lots of channels, right? Because if you have a thousand channels, it's getting pretty, pretty uh, actually memory intensive to represent all thousand channels for a large image. So we want to downsample the image and essentially represent the image at different resolutions in our network. Now there are two ways this commonly is done. Um, one is by some sort of pooling operation. Okay, so what we can do, and this is showing max pooling here, but really you can apply this to average pooling or things like this as well. You take some block, and commonly it's a four by four block in your image to produce a, um, a downsampling by, to, to give an image that's half the size in both spatial dimensions. You take some sort of uh, block in your input, often two by two by two block, and you somehow combine these quantities here to produce a single quantity in your output and you're in sort of next channel. And the max pooling operation, for example, would say which of these four values, and you typically do it individually for each channel now, so which of these four values in this one channel has the maximum has the maximum value? And you just set this thing here to be equal to that maximum value. Okay. That's called the max pooling operation. You can also do average pooling, so average pooling would just be you take the average of those four things and that becomes your, your next layer. Okay, so, that, so both of these are, are valid operations. Um, and they're both commonly, actually pretty commonly used in practice. Both max pooling and average pooling are very common operations that people, people use in practice. The second possibility are things called strided convolutions. So the idea here is that if normally we take our filter and we sort of apply it to every possible location in the image, that's the typical way of applying a convolutional filter. But if instead of doing that, what if instead we sort of take our image, our, our, our filter, and we move it over by more than one location at a time, right? We could also do this, and this would also result in a downsampling of our input image, right? Because we're sort of, you know, have only this position, and then not this one, uh, but then just, just this one, right? So not, you know, draw this here. So, you know, we don't take this one in red here. We only take the ones in blue. Oops, messed that up. That's the one we take. Okay, and 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 that obviously will also produce a downsampled image, right? Because we're we're gonna produce an image that's half the resolution of our original image. Okay? And so both of these two operations, in fact, either pooling uh, in this sense or strided convolutions, produce outputs that are in this case half the size, half the resolution of our input in both spatial dimensions. So a quarter of the number of, of pixels, basically. And um, you, you can use larger strides too, or larger uh, sort of uh, regions for max pooling or average pooling. Um, but these sort of things in general are very common. Uh, it's also so common, for example, in, in maybe the last layer to do a single, uh, you know, whatever filters you have left, you do like a single average pooling to collapse this to a single vector um, and things like this. So, so these, are, these are all very sort of common operations and they really play a large role in, in, in most networks. One of these two types, because most networks for both computational and kind of representational regions want to downsample the image in later layers in the network. All right, the next feature that you may see in convolutions um, are groupings. So the, ch the challenge here is that even with the sort of simplifications of, uh, com of, of convolutions we talked about, um, for large numbers of inputs and output channels, if you have very, very large input-output channel combinations, filters can still have a large number of weights. And the way to think about this, remember, is that each location in the filter is a, each location, so each sort of you know, individual filter, um, you should think of as a matrix that is in R, C in by C out. And so for you know, maybe practical reasons, if you have 10,000 inputs channels, for example, or 10,000 output channels, um, this is gonna just start to be a very big, even with all the simplifications of convolutional networks, forming a matrix that big, let alone sort of, you know, K by K of them for your, for your whole filter, might just be too big. It might just be too too many parameters for your network. Um, and so what people often do in these situations is they use something called group convolutions. And the idea of group convolutions is that instead of sort of all the input channels here leading to all the output channels, 
we have only some collection of input channels leading to some similar collection of output channels. So say you have maybe four channels and, and uh, four input channels and four output channels, maybe only the first two input channels lead to the first two output channels uh, and things like that. Um, and this could actually be brought all the way down to the case where maybe you just do the convolutions kind of channel by channel. So maybe this channel here um, only depends on this one input channel and things like this too. This is, this, this is actually done, these, these are called uh, this extreme version of the group size being equal to the number of channels. Um, so the, the number of groups being equal to the number of channels. Um, this is, this are, these are sometimes called depthwise convolutions and they actually are becoming, you know, we, we have some work in fact, even on uh, some, my group has some work on sort of using these to, to great use. So these sorts of things are very common as ways to reduce the parameter count of convolutions when even a normal convolution, and maybe if you want to use a larger filter size, stuff like that, would still be too many parameters to sort of practically use in a network. All right, and the last one I'll talk about uh, is dilations. And dilations are address the sort of the, the, the final problem I'll mention about, um, about convolutions, though, I would say that these these were very popular for a while. I see them a little bit less. Um, they're, they're used slightly less these days. I think people tend to use more sort of just concatenation to patches and things like this these days. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more when we talk about transformers. Uh, but the 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 problem that convolutions have, or one problem that they have, is that especially if you have small kernel sizes. So if you have like a three by three filter here, right? Um, Convolutions have a relatively limited, what's called a receptive field by at each layer. What I mean by that is, you know, this location here, it only depends on these three locations in the input image. And I know I sort of sold this as an advantage originally, right? So that convolutions capture local effects. But the reality is there are also downsides to this. Um, you might not want this to always be the case. You might want your convolutions to have a larger receptive field such that even a single layer can capture more properties of the input, right? Uh, of, of, of the previous layer or capture larger spatial properties of the input. And you could do this in a lot of ways, right? You could sort of, you know, maybe, I don't know, do some combination of average pooling and sort of larger average convolutions. That could all be done. But a very common thing which works really well is even simpler, which is that you add a dilation factor to basically take your, your same filter size as before, but instead of applying it to sort of a single group, you apply it to kind of a spread out. So you sort of spread out this filter kind of, or the, 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 the points that you multiply this filter by, by some dilation factor. So this is a dilation one convolution or maybe dilation two, I forget that the, the, there's sometimes zero conventions or one conventions. Uh, if if uh, we'll, 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 we'll certainly have habits uh, <laughs> very clear uh, if and when you implement it. But the idea here is that we sort of spread out the influence of this across multiple points such that our three by three filter produces a, a um, is able to um, sort of capture more spatial properties of the input. One thing you will notice though, at least naively, if you just do this, then you have the same, a similar problem with padding as you had before. So, this, so that for example, using the same zero padding as this one here, you would produce a two by two image because you could only slide this sort of convolution you know, in, in a two by two location, in, in, in four locations total. So in order to make a similarly sized output with dilations, you have to add more zero padding. Uh, so just, just be aware of that, that you do have to in fact add more padding to do this. Okay, so that actually are the extent of the sort of practical aspects of convolutions that we're gonna talk about. Um, and finally, what we're gonna end this lecture with is discussions on differentiating convolutions. How do we go about actually finding, how do we go about integrating these sorts of things, these sorts of operations into automatic differentiation tools? And the first thing I should say before all of this is that you could, just knowing what you know now, already implement convolutions. It, it, in fact, it wouldn't even be that bad if you do it in the most efficient way possible where you sort of, you know, multiply each each input by sort of one filter at a time and then shift these properly. This is actually not that bad a way of implementing convolutions. Um, but there's a big disadvantage because, because we have an automatic differentiation toolkit, right? And because ultimately convolutions are just, you know, matrix vector multiplies or really, of course, you know, 
everything boils down to just multiplication and addition, but convolution, so you could do it by, you know, on, a, on, a, on a scalar level even. But even sort of with, with, with the math I showed you, you could reduce convolutions to a bunch of matrix vector products, or really matrix matrix products, do it in kind of a more, in a more, um, kind of do it in a more batch set uh, setting. So everything we do here in convolutions, we could do just as matrix vector products. But this is not something we want to do because if you do that, you wind up computing kind of a lot of, you, you, you wind up retaining a lot of sort of duplicated work in your compute graph, right? You have to sort of store all the intermediate products of the convolution then before you add them up. Uh, and that creates a sort of way too much memory consumption in your compute graph. So it's important instead to implement convolutions as atomic operations within your automatic differentiation toolkit. And that means we need to be able to differentiate them. We need to have sort of the, we need to find them basically as ops in Needle, not as modules in Needle. Uh, it's, it's another way of putting all of this, right? So if we're gonna implement convolutions as an op, uh, as an operator, we need to know both how to compute them, which we've kind of covered so far, but we also need to know, well, we've covered so far, but we haven't gotten into details of how you actually compute these in practice. Um, we need to know how to compute them and we need to know how to compute their gradient, or, or in other words, sort of multiply by the adjoint, compute all the adjoints that we need. All right, so the basic problem here is, is exactly what I sort of laid out just now, is that if we define our operator, because we want to have kind of an atomic operator, if we define our operator as Z equals some convolution between our input X and our filters W, where again, Z here would be sort of a rank three tensor, uh, order three tensor, X would be a order, uh, also an order three tensor, height by width of channels, and W would be an order four tensor for, you know, all the, all the filter locations plus all the, uh, um, uh, channel inputs by channel outputs. But let's, you know, let's, let's not worry too much about sizes here of, of tensors and stuff. Cause it's actually very, if, if, if you break these all down into sort of individual tensors, these, 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 I mean, this is a, you know, the derivative of a rank three operation with respect to a, a, a rank three tensor with respect to a rank four tensor. I mean, it gets, it gets pretty complicated, right? But let's just think sort of, sort of an intuitive level, how we might go about multiplying these two adjoints. Because remember, in automatic differentiation, when we want to do this, we want to be able to multiply some adjoint here with these two partial derivatives, or really Jacobians more generally, right? The derivative with respect to our weights and the derivative with respect to the input, right? So this, this operator has two inputs here and one output, and so we need to be able to differentiate with respect to either of its two inputs, either with respect to the weights or with respect to its input. Okay, so how do we go about doing this? How do we go about sort of computing these derivatives? Because, again, on first glance, these seem quite complicated, right? These seem like, well, that's, you know, geez, these are, these are uh, rank, these are the derivative of, you know, a, a three, a rank three tensor with respect to a rank four tensor or another rank three tensor. These, these, these get pretty complicated, right? Um, and so, and so it's, it's important to emphasize that this is, you don't want to do this out term by term. You want to think kind of conceptually about what these things are really doing and use, and use that as your, as your way of actually computing these, these, these properties. Okay. So to motivate this, I'm going to consider the case of matrix vector products, okay? And so remember that in a matrix vector product, um, let's, let's just to simplify things a bit as kind of a motivation, because what we're gonna do in a second is we're going to recast, um, we're gonna recast uh, convolutions actually as really big kind of blown up matrix vector products, and that's how we're going to kind of use this analog. But to be clear, we're not actually gonna form those things, we're just gonna sort of think about them conceptually like that. Okay, so um, let's think about sort of a simpler operation here where X is the vector, Z is another vector, and W is a scalar. So let's, you know, let's I guess I could just even write these out. So let's think about X being a vector that's in Rn, um, Z a vector in Rm, and so W would be a vector or be a matrix in Rm by N, right? Um, let's think about that as our, as our starting point. 
Now, we know from uh, sort of our, our basic differentiation rules and maybe with our cheating ones or our non-cheating ones that the derivative of z with respect to x uh, for this operation here is just equal to w, right? So that's sort of our, our, um, our uh, the, the nature of the operation here. And hopefully, actually, what I'm about to say here makes total sense once you've implemented your, your homework one here. But when we want to compute this, the product of our you know, incoming adjoint, and we have to, in fact, transpose it to make this a sort of valid matrix operation, we want to m multiply this by our matrix W to compute this sort of, to compute the adjoints we need for automatic differentiation, we have to compute this product here, right? We have to compute our, our, our incoming adjoint transposed times our, our uh, vector of, of uh, our, our matrix of weights here. Right? But that, of course, really is equivalent to um, just taking our matrix transpose times this vector V. Right? So thinking of it in terms of you know, multiplying uh, a vector on, on the right, um, this is multiplying the, the, by the transpose of W. And so the only point I want to make from this is that when our forward pass involves computing W times the forward variable, our backward pass involves multiplying by the transpose of W. In fact, um, the transpose is sometimes called the adjoint in, in some linear algebra, right? So this, these things are all very related, uh, of course. Um, and so, again, that's, that's the key point. Multiplying a input by a matrix, or really any linear operation, in fact, which is what we're going to exploit here, um, if our forward pass multiplies by that operator, our backward pass has to multiply by its transpose. Okay, that's the only point I'm trying to make here. So the question is, what is the transpose of a convolution? Right? What's, what's the equivalent of transposing a convolution? All right, so for this, I'm going to now um, get, a bit, get, get, get a bit in some detail. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually write out a convolution in terms of a matrix operation. All right, so let's let me let me now actually use the use sort of a, a bunch of possible a bunch of possible sort of inputs here. Let me take our output. I'll use different colors. In fact, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna consider a simplified case where I only have a um, a one D convolution. So I'm gonna take a one D signal and convolve it with a one D set of filters because it's easier to, easier to view that way. Um, but the Hopefully, it's obvious how this will extend to the to the two D case. In fact, we will show how to implement this in the two D case um, when we talk about in a few lectures from now the, the the implementation of convolutions. So let's let's consider a case where we want to create a uh, an output which is a a five D vector here. So it'll be Z one, Z two, Z three, Z four, and Z five. And this is going to be equal to our input x. So I'm actually even going to zero pad it. So this would be, hopefully I'm getting the sizes okay here. So I'm going to have zeros there. Then I'm going to have x1, then x2, x3, and zero. So let me just make sure I get all the entries here. x3, x4, x5, and zero. Okay. And then I'm going to be convolving this with in this case a three-dimensional weight matrix, all right? So it'll be um, W1, W2, and W3. Okay, so that's my operation I want to apply there. All right, so the thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to write this operation out in terms of a matrix equivalent operation. So I'm going to think here of x as a vector, not a zero padded vector, just, just, just a vector itself, just the, the actual elements of x as a vector. And I'm going to create a matrix such that my mm -hmm. vector of z's, sort of treating z as a vector here, is equal to this matrix times the vector representation of x. All right, so maybe, maybe a little bit more formally. What I mean by that is, you know, z here can be itself a vector, right? z1, z2, z3, z4, and z, z5. 
bit nicer brackets on that. All right, so that's going to be equal to something. You don't quite know what yet. Times, maybe I should make, maybe I should make that something in blue to be consistent here. Something in blue times my vector of x's. So x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. All right, so the question is, what is that something? What is this something here that we actually would, would need? And I'm gonna call this, this thing here, I'm gonna call this w hat. But what is this, what is this matrix? All right? Um, so what this is, well, well and, and of course, this is gonna have to be equivalent to, on some level, you know, in the end, this should be equivalent to our vector x convolved with w. So what we need to fill in there? I mean, obviously this shouldn't, you know, this this thing here should involve entries of, of W, but what should we fill in to make this this to make this kind of kind of valid? Well, let's think about it. Let's think about what do we multiply, what you know, what, what do we multiply by our, our vector here of x's to produce z1? Well, um, what we do for that vector, I'm gonna try to sort of make best use of the medium here, is we sort of take our filter and we kind of slide it across different values here. Right, as much as my little drawing here lines up with the with these things. Okay, so for the first element, we would take this and kind of put it here. Right, we would multiply zero by w one, uh, so we don't multiply w one by anything. Uh, w two by x one, w three by x two. Okay, so that, in other words, would be well, we multiply x one by w two, um, x two by w three, and we don't multiply anything with the rest. Right. The rest don't don't have any uh, x3 through x5 don't have any impact on z1. Now let's think about z2. Okay, so let's think about z2. Well, we slide our filter over again, and z2 is produced by this sort of element-wise product. We multiply x1 by w1, x2 by w2, x3 by w3, right? And in again matrix form, what what this would be is this would be um, here we'd have we multiply x1 here by w1, x2 by w2, and x3 by w3. And we don't multiply x4 or x5 by anything. Okay, and one more time, I'll do this. So our next element, z3, would be equal to sort of this product, x2 times w1, x3 times w2, x4 times w3, etc. Um, and so what this looks like in the in sort of the matrix form is, well, we don't multiply anything by w1, so we would have a zero here. We multiply w or x2 by w1, so we have a w1 here, and then similarly x3 by w2, x4 by w3, etc. Right? And if I just fill this out, what you'll get is you'll get this next row is going to be w1, w2, w3, and the final row would be this w1, w2. Okay? So this is the matrix form. This matrix operation here produces the exact same output as our convolution. It is a matrix way of representing our convolution. Okay, so, and that's the that's sort of the key idea here when we think about you know a a tr if we want to multiply by the transpose of this convolution, well, it's it's now doable because now we've written out sort of our convolution as just this 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 matrix here. Um, and so, the, and this is a very general sort of state. Uh, this is a very general thing. We can really write any um, convolution just as this sort of matrix of all our weights, or matrix containing uh, our weights in different locations. Now, I want to be very clear about one thing: we don't actually want to construct this matrix. Um, this is maybe reasonable for this size, but if you have a really long sequence like and things like that, you would create a matrix with a whole bunch of zeros here, right? And so, to be very clear, this is a conceptual thing that we're doing. We are not um, actually going to create this matrix. We actually are going to instantiate a kind of a, a different but similar matrix when we for, for efficiency purposes, but we won't be instantiating this matrix. Um, what we're actually going to be doing is just using this sort of conceptual idea to represent what the transpose of a convolution is. Okay, so this is our this is our um, sort of matrix here. And maybe actually let me let me do this again because uh, I'm going to need it on the next page. Let me copy it and go to my to my next page. So 
the question I have is that once we know what W is here, let me let me paste it in here. Um, once we know here what W is, um, how do we compute, and I'll put it kind of up there, how do we compute W transpose? Well, now that we know what W is matrix form, now it's easy, because now we just transpose W, right? So let's just create W transpose. I'll, I'll call this W hat. W hat transpose would be, well, what is it? Um, so the first row would be W2, W1, and then zeros. Oops. So my pen is flaking out again. Um, that's the first row, because that's, that's this column here. The next row would be this column. So it would be W3. W, sorry, uh, yeah, W3, W2, W1, and 0, 0. Next, you would have uh, this column here. So that would be 0, W3, W2, W1, and 0. And then 0, 0, W3, W2, W1, and 0, 0, 0, W3, W2. So that's, that, that's our transpose. But now something really cool happens, which is that this matrix here looks a whole lot like this one. It's just that the order of, it has the exact same sort of, you know, elements on the, on the diagonal, on the, on the sort of diagonal and the bands are all, they're, they're all the same, uh, just like in this one. Um, the only difference is the ordering. So this one has the ordering W3, W2, W1. This one has the ordering W1, W2, W3. But the point is, multiplying by this matrix, the transpose of this, well, this operator here is also a convolution, right? Multiplying this is exactly convolving an input with the same filter, just the filter flipped. So instead of convolving kind of with W1, W2, W3, we convolve with the flipped left to right version of this filter. And that is sort of, and by the way, that's that's the relationship um, I mentioned way before, sort of signal processing uses this flipped version, they actually call that a convolution. That, that This is why this sort of flipping is actually quite common. The key idea here is that multiplying by the transpose of a convolution is equivalent to convolving with a flipped version of the filter, right? So in other words, to actually compute this operation, say we're gonna compute this sort of derivative here, we wouldn't actually form the Jacobian or anything like that, right? To compute this operation, nor do we even form this matrix, Right? What we, what we do to compute this term here is we say that, well, our product between our adjoint term with respect to x, because again, remember, to get our original derivative like that, that, that had w in it, this is a few slides back, we were talking about derivatives with respect to x here. So that's, our, that's, that, that's the best derivative we're, we're, we're doing. Well, this thing is just equal to the convolution of our adjoint term with like the flip of W. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive, right? That's pretty neat. Um, that's all we're doing when we're doing a convolution, when it's transpose of a convolution. We don't need to form this matrix. We don't need to do anything other than just flip our filter and convolve with that. And of course, if you do this twice, you sort of get, you know, goes back to the original filter, right? Um, so that's really, that, that, that's sort of really impressive, I think. Um, and a really nice property of convolutions is that can, in order to multiply by the transpose of convolution, you just convolve with a flipped convolution. Um, and so this is how we compute in practice our adjoints needed for convolutions um, without having to actually store, you know, or e either compute rank three tensors or stuff like this, or rank seven tensors, right? 
um, and without having to even form these matrices because this, this, this matrix here, this construction, that was just sort of for, for illustration, right? That was just sort of to derive this fact. Once we know this about it, we can just implement our, our backward pass as a convolution itself. Okay, and this is, by the way, this is also sort of setting off, setting off alarms that, you know, you could implement the op then as calling the original function and stuff like this, right? So there's a lot of very nice things about it. Okay, so this is almost the whole story, but the, the rest of the story actually uh, involves the other adjoint we need to form, namely the derivative with respect to W. So this whole one was for the derivative with respect to X, right? Because that was sort of how we derived this. Um, what about the derivative with respect to W? And for this, but actually not just for this, but also for sort of very practical purposes, because it turns out that this is exactly how we're going to, in fact, implement convolutions. Um, it turns out that we can also write convolutions in a different way. So if we have our Z, um, maybe I'll even copy from our previous slide here. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'm going to copy this whole thing. Again, trying to use the medium as effectively as I can. Um, let's put it down here. That's the place for it. Um, we can also represent this operation not just in terms of making W a matrix, but we can also represent it as Z, our vector Z here, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and Z5, can also be represented as some matrix, which I'm going to write in black now, reasons you'll see in a second, times the vector representation of our filters. We can end up doing it this way too. And this is actually important because when you differentiate, you know, based upon if you differentiate with respect to, to W or with respect to X, you kind of want to write this, you want to be able to write this in either way, um, either as sort of a product with the the x as a vector or with our weights as a vector. But this is actually doable too. So so we can write it also in this form here. Well, maybe I'll, I'll write this thing. I don't think I even labeled it in the, in the slides maybe, but say, say this thing here is called like x hat, big x hat or something like that. Okay, so how, so how does this work? Well, again, let's just sort of do our, our little operation here for multiplying the First entry z1 would be equal to 0 times w1 plus x1 times w2 plus x2 times w3, right? So that would be our first our first operation there. Um, so what do we multiply? So you know what do we multiply by w1? Well, nothing. That, that's that's zero padded. So what? But, but um, right because that that multiplies this and this. What about w2? Well, w2 multiplies by x1, right? So let's put an x1 here. W3 multiplies by, well, W3 multiplies by WX2. So let's put an X, uh, oops, sorry, this was, um, messed that up. This should be a, W1 should be zero. It's W2 that multiplies by X1. And W3 multiplies by uh, X2. All right, do one more and then I'll, I'll just fill it out after this. But if we, again, slide our filter over, in the first location, W1 will multiply X1 w2, x2, w3, x3, etc. All right, so we would have x1, x2, and x3, and I'll just finish this. I don't think I maybe can give myself quite enough space here, but um, in the next row, we would have x2, x3, x4, x3, x4, x5, and x4, x5, and zero. And you can sort of just validate that, that is in fact the right matrix. Okay. This is an operation here, this, this sort of expanding the vector in this way, or x vector this way, is an operation called um, m to call. And this is important for two reasons. The first reason is that if we want to compute this vector here, it's very nice to be able to represent z, basically, um, as equal to this case, right? So this is what we're writing here, so we're writing z equals some big matrix x times w, because then we have that the derivative of um, this operation with respect to W 
is equal to our big matrix X, right? So that's sort of why we might want to do this. Um, but this actually also ends up being quite useful, unlike the previous one, where sort of W, we wouldn't want to form this big W because it just has too many zeros. This operator actually, it has some extra zeros, but it's, 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 it's much fewer. Um, and you can kind of convince yourself that, you know, each element here is only going to have the elements we're multiplying our actual weights with. And so there's going to be many fewer zeros in this matrix. And in fact, it turns out that in many cases, the most efficient way to implement convolutions is to first explicitly construct this matrix, this M to call matrix, and then do our entire convolution as one big matrix matrix product. All right, so somewhat surprisingly, because you think that's, you know, this, this is definitely creating sort of wasted, spa wasted space here, right? Because this is sort of creating x1, x1 is, you know, x3, x2 is being multiple, is uh, being represented multiple times here. You end up actually replicating each location in your in your signal. And, and in the case of 2D, you know, I should mention this all holds for 2D cases too. So just like before, in, in 2D, you know, the um, you also have this property that the multiply, multiplication with the transpose is equal to the flipped, in this case, flipped upside down and left, right. And in 2D, you would also have sort of, you know, uh, you, uh, this, this similar kind of matrix operation for this, for this convolution. Um, but the, the, the surprising thing to a certain degree is that it often ends up being worthwhile to duplicate your memory in this way for the sake of being a bit more efficient um, when it comes to the computations of matrix matrix multiplication. Now, it's very important that this is that this is <coughs> sort of all defined in the op of convolutions. You don't want to put this term in your, you know, do it explicitly in your computational graph because that would create a lot of memory in your computational graph. It would create, you know, if you have a three by three filter, it would create nine times, you know, as much, as much memory consumption in your computational graph. Um, but as a way of implementing the, the compute of your op, this winds up being kind of a very efficient method. And it will also help you in actually computing the derivatives and the, the, the really the, the adjoints for your automatic differentiation to do it sort of all this way. So that in fact is the, is the entirety of what um, I'm, we're gonna talk about today with convolutions. Uh, it covers sort of what the operations are and how you start to integrate them into automatic differentiation tools. And I even sort of pointed to this notion of implementing them like this. But it turns out to figure out how to implement convolutions properly, we first need to understand how matrices and vectors and tensors are really stored in memory because it turns out that all these operations, despite seeming quite complex, you know, mapping multiple things, they can all actually be done quite easily by manipulating stride operations in the internal representation of matrices. And, and so all these things, if you have the right calls, namely the, the as strided call, the as strided call, which is like this magic function that we'll talk about next time, um, or not next time, but in a few lectures from now, actually introduce them to the case of convolutions, um, you can do this all in very few lines of code. So writing all these operations ends up being a complex operation, certainly, but done in very few lines of code. All right, so that's, that's all for today. And see everyone uh, next time when we talk about kind of the, the taking a pause now and talking next about the internals of linear algebra libraries so that we can efficiently implement things both like matrix, matrix products, but also things like convolutions. All right, see everyone soon.